It's one thing to listen to doom and gloom about food and fertilizer shortages, skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. It's quite another thing to hear practical, immediately actionable advice from experts who can help you reduce the fear, anxiety, and burden of these problems. Tune in now to the Surviving Hard Times podcast from the Finding Genius Foundation with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Surviving Hard Times podcast, sponsored by the Finding Genius Foundation. I've got a great guest today, uh, George Gammon. He's the founder of Rebel Capitalist. I found him because I uh, watch YouTube and uh, I've heard him speak with Robert Kiyosaki and a number of other high-end people that are in economics and finance. And uh, he's got some really pithy, useful comments. Uh, I don't always understand them, frankly, because, uh, you know, I think George knows maybe too much. But again, I really value what he has to say. So I'm really thankful he's on my show. So we're going to talk about the economy, the state of the economy, what may happen in the near future. And uh, welcome, George. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your background first and listeners. Um, how did you get to care about the issues that you look at and, uh, you know, do your analyses? Like, what's your, what's your history like? Well, I almost flunked out of high school. I've never taken an econ class or a finance class in my life. So we can full disclosure. No, but I was an entrepreneur and I retired in 2012 at the ripe old age of 38. And when I retired, I had enough to where if I earned maybe a five or 6% return on my money, I wouldn't have to go back to work. So that was kind of how the math worked out. And I didn't want to delegate that responsibility to a financial planner uh, as an entrepreneur uh, right or wrong, I had an extreme amount of confidence in my own ability. So I wanted to invest my own money. But I learned very quickly that the skill set that makes you a good entrepreneur is pretty much the exact opposite of the skill set that makes you a good investor. So I started doing a ton of research to try to figure things out at this time. Again, this was 2012 summer. I I didn't know what a yield curve was. I didn't know what the Fed was. I mean, I knew absolutely nothing, zero. And I was in Singapore at the time at the Marina Bay Sands and I had about 10 minutes before dinner date. And I was on YouTube and I stumbled upon a series from one Milton Friedman called Series of Freedom to Choose, uh, or Free to Choose, I think it was. And, uh, that just completely changed my world. Uh, it, he just articulated everything that I had in my mind so eloquently. And from there, I started researching Thomas Sowell, who is now probably my favorite economist. And then I started studying investors that had kind of that Austrian mentality, the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, guys like Jim Rogers and Jim Grant, uh, Peter Schiff, Doug Casey, Rick Rule just to name a few. And uh, my favorite was by far Jim Grant and, or excuse me, Jim Rogers. And so, uh, you know, his whole thing is just, you know, you want to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. So at the time, real estate was very cheap. So I started buying a lot of real estate and that was my entry into the investment arena. And then if you fast forward to 2019, I stuck with the real estate, but I started investing overseas. And I, I was just absolutely passionate 
going back to 2012, that's what really triggered my enthusiasm for macroeconomics. I don't know if this may be laughable, but are there any current politicians that have any um, shred of, you know, non-Keynesian or Austrian, Austrian economics in their blood and in their words? Or is it, there's no one out there that's really, uh, you know, speaking about what, what is really happening economically? There's a couple guys that might have a decent idea of how Austrian economics works. I and mean, Ron Paul was the, the perfect example. So I would assume he taught a lot of that to Rand, but they, they might kind of understand it at surface level, but there's no politicians that I know of that, I mean, there's no central bankers for that matter that truly understand economics, global macro, when you are considering the global dollar monetary system. And we can get into that and what makes that very unique, esoteric, and very complex to the point where these central bankers don't even understand it. If you want me to go down that path, I'm happy to, <laughs> but I don't want to bore all of your, your listeners, but, uh, well, no, anyway. problem, no problem, but, but yeah, keep going with your history, please. Yeah. That's how, uh, that 2012, that's what really sparked my interest. And then in 2019, I was investing in real estate. I started in 2015. I started investing in real estate in Colombia outside the U S started a TV show about, uh, remodeling, like an HG TV show, had a staff editors, camera people. We got done with the first season and I said, well, let's start a YouTube channel because we had a bit of a break there. And I didn't think anyone would want to watch a video on uh, macro, but that was really what I was passionate about. So I started doing videos on real estate, which I really, you know, obviously I enjoyed, but those videos didn't do real well. And the whiteboard videos that I did on macroeconomics did extremely well. So it just worked well. And the channel you know, blew up and maybe eight months later. So we had a hundred thousand subscribers. Now maybe, I don't know, 375. I've got a couple channels. So we got over 400 total, about 2 million views a month. And the podcast gets, uh, I don't know, maybe a million downloads or something like that. And now we've been able to do live events and continue to just talk to super interesting people in the, uh, economic space. And I'm just every single morning I wake up and I'm super excited. Uh, I'm just doing what I love. No, that's excellent. Your audience, what information and guidance do they seem to crave? Like, do they really want a macroeconomic picture? And if so, why? Or do they want a personal economy type picture for themselves? Well, I think they're one in the same in the sense that in order to build your financial future for yourself and your family, you have to have an understanding of macroeconomics. I always tell people we're not living in 1981 where, you know, Paul Volcker comes in and brings the Fed funds rate up to 18 or 19 percent. You could just buy the the long bond, we call it. You know, you could just buy a 10 year treasury and just sit on it and do nothing. Uh, investing has never been easy, but it was a lot easier back then. Uh, you didn't have to really know, you know, what was going on with the the mark, or you didn't have to know what was going on with uh, Malaysian palm oil or something like that. Now you've not to, you've not only got to understand that just even if you're just a simple average Joe or Jane in the United States, you not only have to understand how that stuff works, but you also really have to understand the global monetary system because at the end of the day, there's all these cross currents at play, you know, and I use the GFC as a good example. So prior to the GFC, let's call it 2005, 2006, you could have had all these arguments as to why local real estate was going to go uh, up or down in value. You know, there's population coming in from California. There's going to be significant job growth. You've got, it, it's on a great street. There's gentrification in this area, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have the global monetary system break down, like we had in 2007 and 2008, all of that other stuff, all those other little cross currents get wiped out by the tsunami of global macro. So that's why uh, I think it's crucial that people at least are cognizant of it and understand it to a certain degree so then they can better predict the probabilities of certain outcomes and then adjust their portfolio accordingly based on their personal objectives. Yeah, whenever I consider problems that are going on, you know, I think about it one way, and I always think about it in the context of the U.S. because I'm here, but I also do speak to multiple people from different countries, like for inflation. You know, I think about inflation here, and I reason out why it's happening, et cetera. But then when I speak to, you know, one guy I know in Australia, and he says it's there, and 
other people in Pakistan and in the UK, the way I was looking at it, there's no way it's going to. You're saying how when you talk to people in other countries and they're having significant problems with consumer price inflation, you realize that it's a global phenomenon. So uh, understanding that, that that it is a global phenomenon, you have to start reverse engineering that and say, okay, well, why? Why is it? And what you come to the conclusion very quickly that uh, the solution, let's say, for consumer price inflation is not more currency units. Uh, the solution for consumer price inflation is more stuff. <laughs> it's more goods and services. So globally, if we have these supply chains breaking down and we have less stuff being produced, then regardless of how many currency units we create through, let's say, stimulus checks, as an example, or how many, how much money we give people in order to afford the higher prices, it's the, the problem is only going to get worse because the, the, the reason you have high prices in the first place is because you have a, a supply demand imbalance. Therefore, the higher prices are supposed to bring down demand, increase supply, which creates an equilibrium. But w- unfortunately, what we're doing, Globally, all these politicians are doing it, not just in the United States, but they're saying, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and increase taxes on these oil companies, a windfall tax as an example. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that, those currency units, and then we're going to give them to people so they can afford the higher gas prices. Well, what are they doing? They're increasing demand and they're decreasing supply. (laughs) So you see, you could, if you just understand it at those levels and you start by talking to all your friends in all these other countries, and then coming to a conclusion as to why there's the problem and then what solves the problem, then you can look at the policies being enacted and then you can determine whether those policies will make the problem better or make the problem worse. And if you come to the conclusion that it's going to make the problem worse, then you can adjust your portfolio accordingly. Hey, George, so do you think that uh, this is deliberate, that inflation was caused by government's pandemic response? This is what I think, that, you know, the pandemic response was to print all this money or cause it to come into existence. That caused inflation. Now they're trying to cover it up with, you know, oh, look, the supply chain shortage is great. That'll artificially prop up demand. And, oh, we're going to do, like you said, this windfall tax, and that'll artificially prop up demand and maybe hide this inflation. Do you think that's what's happening? To a large degree, yes. I mean, a simple thought experiment that I've used on a lot of my videos is if you go back to 2019, And let's say that we never had uh, COVID. Therefore, we never had lockdowns. We never had stimulus checks. We never had uh, governments basically locking people in a cage for a year, telling them that they could no longer produce goods and services. Uh, Would we have the problem to the degree to which we have it today of consumer price inflation? I think the answer is obviously uh, no, we would not. So then you have to come to the conclusion that that was a, a contributing factor. That was very significant. And so, again, it takes you back to better understanding how we can solve the problem and how the policies that they are enacting today are just really, they're not even just kicking the can down the road. They're, they're, they're going to make the problem worse because if you are, going back to the oil companies again, if you're taxing them to a greater degree, you could say, well, that's great because they've got this, these windfall profits. Yeah, but that means less capital that they're going to have to invest in future supply coming online. And it's also going to disincentivize them to produce more supply in the future because they know that you're going to tax more of the profit. And so they're going to be far less, uh, they're, they're going to be more risk averse, I think is the way to say it. And then again, you're giving the people more currency units through whether it's PPP loans, whether it's uh, stimulus checks, and they have more purchasing power, more demand. And then it makes the consumer price inflation go up. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what we're dealing with right now. You know, unfortunately, I think the, the, the problem can only be solved by decreasing. Well, let me take that back. I think the way they're going to try to solve the problem through the Federal Reserve is by decreasing demand by lowering asset prices. So again, this is another reason why I think understanding the global macro picture is very important because I would assume most of your viewers or listeners have the majority of their net worth in their home equity or in their 401k. So then how, you say, how could the, uh, how could the Fed 
lower prices? Is it price controls or what other methods would they have to try to do that? Bring down asset prices. So if you're looking at the, the, the consumer debt, the balance sheet or corporate debt, sovereign debt, we're at all time highs. So it's very difficult for them to just raise rates to a point where they could significantly affect inflation because theoretically you'd have to take interest rates into where they, what the real rates were positive. So what that means is if you take interest rates and increase them, you've got to get them above the rate of consumer price inflation in order to have positive real rates. And there's, that would mean that they've got to take interest rates up to call it 8.59%. Uh, we're at 75 basis points right now. So there's absolutely no way they can do that. There's no way they can do that alone. So the other dial, let's say, that they have right now would be the fact that it's unfortunate, but it's a fact that a large percentage of the U.S. economy is dependent upon asset prices because a large portion of people's spending power is a result of their 401k being extremely high, their home equity being high. So the Fed knows that they can't normalize rates. They might be able to increase them 75 basis points, maybe get it up to a percent and a half or something like that. But that's not going to move the needle to a significant degree for consumer price inflation. And that's what the politicians are most concerned with because inflation is a, is political kryptonite. So, you know, we saw just the other day that Joe Biden sat down and met with Yellen and Jerome Powell and to come up with a quote unquote plan as to how they're going to tackle inflation. And because Joe Biden knows that this is his number one priority. This was by far his biggest problem right now. So he communicates that probably using a lot of uh, four-letter words <laughs> to Jerome Powell and say, hey, you got to get this inflation down. So if you're Jerome Powell, he says, I can't raise rates. What do you do? You have to talk like you're going to raise rates. You have to, t- I always say, they've got to talk like Paul Volcker but they have to act like Ben Bernanke. So in, in economist speak, that means you've got to talk very hawkish, meaning you're going to raise rates. You're going to have a strong dollar. You're going to be tough on inflation, but you're going to, the way you act is very dovish, meaning monetary policy is still very, very loose, right? And so what this does is it makes the market, it sends a signal to the market. That, oh my gosh, the Fed is going to be tough. They're going to raise rates. They're going to bring on a recession. They're going to do these things. So we need to sell off the risk assets. The risk assets are the stocks. That brings down the level of the stock market. And if it brings down the level of the stock market, that decreases people's purchasing power. They have less disposable income. They buy less stuff. And in an economy that's 70% consumer spending, that contracts the economy very slowly and orderly, and it brings down the rate of inflation. I don't think it'll bring it down to 2% again, but it brings down headline CPI to, let's say, 6%, 5%, that gives the, the administration some political cover going into midterms. But what about natural market forces that would bring down inflation? Like, you know, prices of essentials are going up and people are getting squeezed, and I would think a, a higher percentage of their monthly budget that they live on has to go to essentials. So there's less money for, you know, to buy cars, there's less money to buy Starbucks, et cetera. So wouldn't that reduce demand and therefore bring prices down in certain areas, but it would funnel again, more money to the essentials? Absolutely. And this is what, and this is a great point. So you're talking about the difference between the 1940s and the 1970s, as far as consumer price inflation. So in the 1940s, we had massive inflation in 1947 as an example, where the CPI got up to 19.5%. But then two years later, we had deflation. It was negative three. So you had this huge, huge swing and prices came down and the Fed didn't raise rates because the yield curve was pegged during that time. The long bond, they'd only allow it to trade at a max of 2.5%, where in the 1970s, now inflation didn't go up in a straight line. Inflation is always very volatile. Uh, so it goes up to 10%, down to 8%, up to 11, down to 9, down to, you know, 6, up to 12, but it's gradually, uh, going higher and higher. This was a result of different dynamics at play. So in the 1940s, you had supply chain issues. You had supply shocks. This is what drove prices higher along with the price controls that they had after World War II or, or, you know, during and after World War II. 
And so then in the 1970s, you had a monetary expansion. So going back to your scenario where you talked about robbing Peter to pay Paul, if the monetary, uh, if the monetary, I should say broad money, if the number of dollars that are circulating in the real economy, chasing goods and services is increasing, then they're going to have the money to pay the gas or to buy the gas and the food and the shelter. But then they're also going to have the currency units to buy the other stuff. So aggregate demand doesn't go down. So you just see this inflation price spiral, right? But if we're not creating more currency units, then to your point, some prices are going to go up, which is going to suck money or purchasing power away from other things. They're going to go down and it's going to be far more like the 1940s. So the question becomes, okay, are we going to get more currency units and how do we get them? Well, 2020 gave us a great example because M2 money supply went up increased by over 20%. How'd they do it? They did it through government deficit spending that was monetized by the Federal Reserve, meaning the Federal Reserve was doing all this quantitative easing, buying a lot of that debt. So the, we saw the, do, the amount of dollars really spike up. So it be, an economic you have to answer an economic question by first and foremost answering a political question. In the future, if we have a recession, which we most likely will, if the Fed is able to bring down asset prices, bring down inflation, are they going to come back in with more uh, fiscal deficit spending that's being monetized by the Fed? And if they do, that most likely increases the currency units. And then we go right back into a period, let's say a year or two, where we have significant rates of inflation that may exceed the headline CPI we have seen throughout 2021 and into 2022. But it, it all, you see the difference there? Is it just going to be a supply shock or is it going to be a supply shock combined with more and more currency units? Yeah, I guess, I guess the Fed is going to intervene because they just can't help themselves. And then it's like, I guess it's like them going on a diet. Oh, I'm going to, I'm not going to eat donuts anymore and ice cream. And after two days, they're like, I can't take it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to eat donuts and ice cream. It sounds like that's what's going to happen. They're going to try to look as if they're doing stuff to fight inflation. But then if things get bad, again, politically, they'll be in such jeopardy. They're like, they'll, they'll probably say, well, we're just going to spend and try to go the other way. Yeah, we people have to realize the economy is similar, very similar to a heroin addict in the sense that it needs more and more of the drug to sustain the same levels of economic activity. Right. And so in this case, it's a, it's, it's monetary heroin. And what happens is if you just take away that monetary heroin, then the heroin addict goes into withdrawals and you got big problems. So then the, you know, if, if you're dealing with this heroin addict, if you don't want them to, to die of a heart attack or whatever that withdrawal would do, then you need to give them more heroin to, to prop them back up. And you can sit there and talk tough, like, oh, we're going to take away the heroin. We're going to take away the heroin. But when you do, sometimes, you know, most of the time, they're going to inject more of the drug because they don't want to deal with the pain of those withdrawals. And that's the exact same thing that's happening to our economy right now. And, of course, the heroin addict is the economy, and the Fed and the government are the individuals that are giving that heroin addict more of the drug. So do, do you, and from what I've heard, like 40% of all the currency in circulation was, was added during 2020 with all these stimulus. I don't know. Are we now at a point where this back and forth behavior is just going to, is going to lead us in like an upward spiral into destruction? Like are we, are we now too far gone after what they've done? Well, here's how I'd answer the question because it, it you have to have a deleveraging, but it doesn't necessarily have to be through inflation. It, which is normally what you get, uh, or no, that's the path of least resistance for the governments. It can be through deflation as well, some similar to what we saw in the 1930s. So I guess the question is, can they keep doing what they're doing and just continuing to kick the can down the road and going through this cycle of propping up the economy through the monetary heroin, the economy collapses, or we go through a big recession, stock market crash, and then they come right back in with more quantitative easing, with more bailouts, and then just continue to try to go through this game of uh, financial engineering, let's call it. And the answer is yes, they, it is possible for them to continue to do this, but there are no free lunches. So what we have to understand is the longer they play this game, 
the more it's going to distort the economy. Just like the more heroin that heroin addict takes, they may still be alive, but it's making them more and more unhealthy, you see. And that's the exact same thing that's happening right now to the really pretty much the global economy. So the easiest way to think about this is just for your listeners to ask themselves, are we creating more stuff or less stuff? That's pretty as simple. That's as simple as it gets. And if we are, if you look at a policy, a government policy, whether it's stimulus checks, whether it's sanctions on Russia, uh, whatever it is, just ask yourself globally, is the global economy going to produce more or less stuff as a result of this long term? And if the answer is less, then that means the standard of living goes down. If the answer is more and it's sustainable, then that means the quality of life can, uh, goes up and up and up. So, and why is this? And the simplest example I can give or thought experiment is just if you're on a deserted island, right? And most people would say, well, what is wealth? What's how many, what, what's your bank account? Well, if you're on a deserted island and you've got a chest full of a billion dollars, but you have nothing, there's nothing but coconuts and some salt water. Are you rich or are you poor? So if most people would say you're poor, even though you've got a billion jo- dollars in your, in your chest. Why? Because there's no stuff. Right. There's no goods and services. So uh, that's why I think if you just boil it down to its simplest form and you look at everything that's going on around the world today that seems rather complex, but if you look at it through that lens, you can start to better understand the probabilities of X, Y, Z happening in the future. And again, position your portfolio according to the conclusions that are, are, are based on that worldview. So if you're in a country that's a net importer, you, you know, you're kind of out of control in terms of what you're going to pay for things. And if, you know, even if you're an exporter, importer, exporter, I mean, with, with global supply chains breaking down, they don't seem like they're going to be coming back, you know, especially with what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. It seems like the world is splitting and there's not going to be globalism. It seems like there's going to be maybe localized trading, but so, I don't yeah, think so that's never actually coming back. That's a great point. So let's go through that. Let me just ask you the question. If, if that's your worldview, which I think is a very solid analysis, does that mean over the next two or three years, globally, we produce less stuff or more stuff? I don't think it, even if we produce more stuff, how, if it doesn't get to you, what's the difference? It's as if it wasn't produced. But they're not going to produce it if, if the demand's not there. They're not going to produce stuff just to produce stuff unless the demand is local or you've got mm-hmm. foreign demand, right? So the, if they're not able to ship it at some point, they're not going to continue to create widgets at a loss. So the, the answer there is it's, it's less stuff. So if we have less stuff, regardless of how much UBI or universal basic income, or regardless of how many, uh, you know, how much quote unquote free money <laughs> the government is giving us, it's, it's just the prices are going to go up to a level that is equal to the level of new currency units that are issued. Therefore, the purchasing power doesn't get any greater. And I would argue that it actually goes down because of the economic distortions that are created by that quote unquote free money and the government meddling in the free market process. You know, let's go back to the stimulus checks that were uh, given out in 20, 2021. Well, then what happened? We had this massive labor shortage that we're still kind of trying to work through today, right? And I would argue that the labor shortage was not only a result of the stimulus checks, but also because the Fed stepped in and provided, well, we won't go into the details, but basically they created an environment that was conducive for the stock market doubling or whatever it did since March of 2020, right? So, and then home equity explodes higher. You had cryptocurrency go from about 800 billion in market cap up to $3 trillion in market cap. And one of the big reasons was because of what the Fed was doing in response to uh, to COVID, right? So you've got all these things that are are at play, and then you you say, okay, well, if I'm a worker, you know, why would I want to go back to work for forty grand a year? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. When my house has just doubled in price, I can always just live on that, and you know, housing prices go up forever. So now I'm rich. You know, same thing with your 401k, same thing with your cryptocurrency. Plus, you've got all this savings 
in your bank account from the stimmy checks that were given to you. So why on earth would you not retire early? Or why would you go back to work if you were a 25-year-old guy that was working retail? Of course you wouldn't. So what does that do? That creates an economic distortion. Then this is where the Austrians really get it right. And it creates malinvestment. And so when now when the money spigot, if you will, turns off, now all of a sudden there's no workers and the prices are sky high. And are we producing less or more? We're producing a lot less because everyone's staying at home, living off their stimmy check. So as a whole, does society get poorer or richer? They get poorer, even though they might have more savings. The price of stuff has gone up to a greater degree. And then we see this right. even with the BIS numbers. We see this with, uh, in, in the domestic numbers here in the United States. We see that real wages are going down, not up. So sure, nominal wages are going up, but when you adjust for inflation, they're going down. So all of these. Well, not, not just in, inflations, but if you're pushed into a higher tax bracket, part of the money you earn, I mean, that also puts you backwards too. So you may make more per hour, but if you end up paying more taxes than you did before, maybe you gain no ground or you go backwards in that sense too. You, you go backwards. Yeah. So think about, that's a great point. So you're, you're, the wages that you're getting are decreasing in purchasing power. In addition to that, you're getting put up into a new tax bracket where they're taking away a higher percentage of your income. <laughs> so your <laughs> purchasing power really is going down and uh, you on paper think, Hey, I just got a raise. Great. Why is it that I'm a lot poorer than I was in 2019? And this mm. is why. Yeah, this is, uh, this is bad news. I mean, what, well, I know it's impossible to predict, but what do you see as the timeline for here? What are people going to experience and how's their behavior going to change? Let's say just for the rest of this year, 2022 in, in the U.S., let's say. Yeah, I think the Fed is going to continue to talk, try to talk down the markets. They said in June, uh, they're going to start quantitative tightening. So they should, uh, I, I noticed just yesterday their balance sheet is going down slightly. So they might have already started quantitative tightening, which is pretty much the reverse of quantitative easing. When instead of buying bonds, they're selling them back into the market, reducing the size of their balance sheet. And this could most likely or will most likely bring down stocks and maybe housing, to, but mostly stocks even more. I think, um, you know, we just had an inverted yield curve, the GDP growth for Q1. Uh, real GDP growth was negative 1.5%. So I think the probability is high. We go into a recession in Q3, Q4, maybe Q1 of 2023. I do think that the CPI will come down from 8.3, you know, maybe in the seven range, six range, something like that. Uh, but then it all depends on what the government's response to the economic slowdown is as far as what we will see in, uh, in 2023. Now, I think as far as uh, people's portfolio construction, what would be wise is to look at, well, I can't give any uh, specific investment advice, but I can tell people what I'm doing. And right now I'm holding a little bit more cash than I normally would in my portfolio because I know that the Fed is trying to bring down the stock market. And they're thinking it's like a dial, like your thermostat. It's not. They, you know, we could wake up one morning and the stock market's down 10 or 15 percent and like, oh, my gosh, you know, what, what just happened? Uh, they're trying to bring it down in a disorderly or in an orderly fashion, but it may be right. disorderly. And to have a little dry powder on the side, it gives you the opportunity to take advantage of some things that might get very, very cheap, just like we saw back in March of uh, 2020. And then longer term, I think that everything we're talking about as far as less and less stuff, you know, you were talking about deglobalization. All right. Mm. Well, and you're talking about supply chains and we're talking about sanctions. All of, of this means less energy. It means less energy available, not just oil, but natural gas and many other things, mostly commodities, right? Or I should say most of the commodities, not just energy. And people don't understand how important natural gas is. You know, natural gas is one of the main components of fertilizer. So if you don't have natural gas, you don't have food. People, people need to understand that very quickly. So all of the things that these governments are doing, these politicians that do not understand economics, is they're creating an environment for the amount of stuff available to us to decrease. And 
uh, energy has very inelastic demand. Also, they're creating an environment that is disincentivizing future production of XYZ energy source, such as coal, such as oil, such as natural gas. Right? The ESG movement is a great example. Right. 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 So what you're doing is, is you're, you're setting things up to have a lot less supply in the future of something that has very inelastic demand. And that means that the price most likely goes way up. Even if, even if demand goes down slightly, you know, you could, well, we got electric cars. We've got all these things. Fine. That may move it slightly, but you're not going to decrease demand for oil. And we can see that in Europe right now. Right. They were really going green. They were uh, implementing all of these policies. But when rubber meets the road, yeah, they need that natural gas really bad or people freeze to death. Bottom line. Right. Yeah. right? Or you have food shortage. You have, you have all these things. So my point there is I think we've gone into a long term commodity super cycle. It started in 2020 when oil prices, if you remember, got to negative thirty eight dollars a barrel. Pretty mm-hmm. safe to say that was a bottom. And oil prices <laughs> and they're yeah. negative, right? Yeah. And uh, if you look at long-term super cycles, they generally last about 10 to 15 years. The last one we went into started in about 96, 98, went to about 2011. And so I think we're just in the beginning couple years of that super cycle that may go till, you know, 2030, 2035. And just like inflation, these super cycles are wildly volatile. So um, what I'm doing is just sitting back and just w- with that long-term view, I'm just waiting for the prices to come to me. And like, as an example, if we had the war end tomorrow with Russia, Ukraine, hopefully it does, uh, you would see oil prices really contract. And I think that could be, could be uh, a buying opportunity. If you see uh, us go through a recession, a global recession, maybe a global depression, in 2022, 2023, that's going to bring down commodity prices. But everyone's going to say, oh, these commodities, you get rid of them and forget it. You know, we bought them in 21 and it was a bad move. Now with this global depression, it's going to go on forever. You know, this is the mindset. You'd be crazy to buy commodities, especially when all these governments are moving to ESG policies. And then, but that's your opportunity. That's your opportunity to buy because you know long term in five, 10, 15 years, you know, that the prices are going to go up because of all these policies that are happening in the backdrop to solve the, to, to fix the global monetary system that we've never fixed and to also try to prop up this system where the policies are doing the, uh, are creating or exacerbating the existing problems by creating less supply and more demand through currency units, uh, government deficit spending monetized by the central banks. Do you think that governments, I don't know if they understand this or not, but they seem to be doing the exact opposite of what's going to help, you know, to avoid pain now based on what they've done themselves. I don't know. They're going to do all this rigmarole and it just seems like it's going to make things worse. It it seems like they're just not going to be able to leave their hands off the economy, you know, of all the economies of the world. And I don't know. I just don't see it. It just seems like they're doing the exact wrong thing. Well, yeah, because they're just trying to buy votes. And unfortunately, economics is counterintuitive to where, uh, you know, for, for most people, if I just said, listen, gas prices are going up. So what should we do to fix the problem? I mean, what if I just gave you guys all more money? Hmm. Most people would say, oh, yeah, OK, great, great. Problem solved. Yeah, gas prices go up to six bucks a gallon. But if the government gives me five hundred dollars a month, then that solves the problem because I can afford to pay those higher gas prices. See, that, they it don't realize really right. that sounds good at surface level, but you start scratching beneath the surface and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute here. No, 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 no. That's increasing demand, decreasing supply, or at least increasing demand. That's going to make the problem worse. So mm. that that's why I think it's, again, very important going back to the beginning of our conversation for people to start to educate themselves on how these things truly work. And, you know, you don't have to spend hours a day like I do, but just, you know, maybe on a weekend here and there, just dive into some YouTube videos. Watch Free to Choose by Milton Friedman, as an example. It's still on YouTube. You know, it was a PBS series in the late 70s, uh, maybe early 80s. But then you, you start to really kind of start to understand how things work to a greater degree. And, and then you yourself 
can answer those questions, you know, that we're talking to the viewer or listener that we're asking and answering right here, you know, are the politicians doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing that, that you don't have to study for hours on end to come to the correct conclusion there. How, I mean, how bad do you think that uh, politicians are going to screw up the market, you know, and the economies of the world for the, over the next few years? Like, do you think it's going to be absolutely terrible or, at some point, will, will they wake up somehow to reality? Or what do you yeah, think the, will well, the good news is the United States has the global reserve currency. So why, why is that such a benefit moving into the 2020s? Because 70% of global transactions are settled in dollars. So what that means is if you are Sri Lanka, let's use them because they've been in the news a lot lately, and you need to buy rubber or you need to buy diesel fuel, let's say, uh, let's say you're buying that diesel fuel from, we'll just say Saudi Arabia. You have to have dollars to buy the fuel. You can't give them their, your local currency. They won't take it. So where do you get the dollars? Well, you have to produce something that is sold in dollars to get that dollar cash flow. You need to buy the other stuff to run your economy. You see, the U S is the only country that doesn't have that problem. So we don't have to produce to consume. All we have to do to get that rubber or to get that diesel fuel is quite literally print the money and give it to, we don't have to produce anything. So now I'm not saying this is a good position because in the long run, this is going to come back to bite us because there is no free lunch. So it's going to, it's created more and more economic distortions. And we talk about hollowing out the middle class through the exportation of our uh, manufacturing base. And this is one of the things that has led to that as far as the dollar being the world reserve currency. But as of right now, when we're going through the 2020s, where there's let because of this uh, protectionism and deglobalization and hoarding of the stuff that the local economies need, you're going to have a high, you're going to have more and more leverage and you're going to have an increased benefit. The United States is by having a currency that they can print in order to get all of those goods that are in short supply, all those commodities that are essential to life. Now, it's it's not to say that the prices won't go up. They absolutely will. But what we're seeing in Sri Lanka right now, or in Turkey, most but more so in Sri Lanka, is they're not it's it's not just prices are going up. They don't have it at any price. Right. Like they don't have diesel at any price. Right. And so I don't think we're going to get to that point in the United States to where we act just don't have it at any price, but the price is definitely going to go up because we're going to be, we're going to have to suck that supply from the rest of the world by offering a higher bid. And, you know, it might come through money printing. And if it does, which it most likely will, that means that although we have the stuff, the standard of living still goes down significantly because we see a rise in consumer price inflation while at the same time, the incomes of people are not going up at the same rate. And again, we, we kind of make the problem worse by the politicians having to bring down the rate of inflation uh, in the only way that they can to get reelected, which is bringing down the stock market. And you get a 1970s type of situation where we had significant consumer price inflation, but the stock market in nominal terms went down between 1972 and 74 by over 50%. And so you really have a, a squeeze of this uh, purchasing power, which will most likely result in many, many quarters, maybe not consecutively, but many, many quarters throughout the 2020s of negative real GDP growth or negative economic output, which reduces the standard of living. There, there's no way to get, it, it's just, that's the end game. It's just a matter of how do you get from A to B? Is it through stagflation? Is it through uh, deflation like the 1930s? There's no way to get from A to B without going through uh, some significant economic pain. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is every crisis is combined or, or every time we have a crisis, we have an equal amount of opportunity for those who are prepared. You go back to the GFC, go back to the dot-com bust. Go back to the 1970s. Go back to Weimar, Germany. That's a great example, right? So there, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of Hugo Steins. He was no. one of the richest people in uh, Germany at the time. So this would have been 
1920, 1921. Well, he saw the writing on the wall. He read the tea leaves. He understood the macro stuff that we're talking about. So what he did as an industrialist is he went out and borrowed as much money as he possibly could to buy all of these companies because he knew, or he thought the probability is high, that they would get hyperinflation. So if they are, go through hyperinflation, that wipes out the debt because the debt is denominated in the currency that basically becomes worthless. So he ended up, within the matter of two or three years during this hyperinflation, he basically got all of these huge businesses for free. And he Hmm. became the most wealthy individual in all of Germany as a result. So that's an example. And I'm not saying we're going to go through hyperinflation here. And I'm not telling your audience to go take out tons of debt. But I'm just using that as an example of when there was a huge crisis. I mean, hyperinflation is devastating. But it created an offsetting and equal to the devastation in the form of an opportunity that if people are prepared, they can actually take advantage of this and not only survive, but financially uh, thrive. But it's people have to adjust their thinking to where they start looking at wealth, not in terms of dollars or currency units, but looking at wealth in terms of a society's ability to produce stuff and at the end of the day, uh, you know, hard assets, shelter, food, energy, stuff like that. So what, I don't know if I call it advice, but I mean, what, if you're a regular person, a regular middle-class person in the U.S. working at, you know, a job, is there anything you can do to to protect yourself against what's coming? Yes. Any, yes, any yes, yes, absolutely. So I would start off, what I, I can just, again, tell people what I'm doing personally. Uh, I always like to have about 10% of my portfolio in gold. And because for me, uh, that's the percent I allocate to what I consider insurance, just an insurance policy. Uh, Whether we go through a huge deflationary environment, let's say we go through the 1930s, gold most likely goes down in price, but also most likely goes up in purchasing power because everything else that you want to buy with the gold goes down more significantly. In an inflationary environment like the 1970s, gold usually does well. Now, gold hasn't done well recently. But it, gold's a long-term asset. Uh, you can't just look at it in two or three year chunks. You got to look at it over the span of time and you can go back 5,000 years and gold can buy the same amount of stuff today as it did a hundred years ago, 500 years ago, a thousand years ago. So that's always my kind of insurance policy. And that's something that everyone can do to a certain extent. You know, you can buy, have 10% of your investable assets in uh, gold. This is that insurance policy. It's going to maintain some level of purchasing power, especially if you have a cash position, dry powder to take advantage of some commodity prices coming down. And then I think what I, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but another thing that just the average Joe and Jane can do is if you have a mortgage, just make sure it's a 30 year fixed rate loan. So why? Because the, the probability is very high that we go through significant inflation over the 2020s. Now, again, it doesn't go up in a straight line. It could be even like the 1940s where it goes way up to 19% and then comes crashing down to negative three and then goes back up to, you know, four, five, six, something like that. But if you lock in a a 30 or if you already have a 30 year fixed rate loan mortgage at let's say 4%, And let's just say that the rate of inflation is going up by 10%. Let's say it averages 10% over the next 10 years. That is a huge transfer of purchasing power from the lender to the borrower because you're paying the the loan back in devalued dollars. You're paying the loan back with less of your overall purchasing power. So that I would, if I had a 30 year loan right now, a fixed rate, I would actually consider that an asset on my balance sheet. Who wouldn't That's consider that a liability, you know, assuming you've got a strong income enough to pay the mortgage. And well, then, if one was, uh, if someone was desperate to get a home loan and they said, I'll take an arm, you know, like say, let's say it adjusts in two or three years. Do you think that's insane? Yeah. In this current climate? I do. I do. And it, and it, listen, yeah. if you, if that's the only way you can afford a home, then you probably shouldn't be buying that home. Right. Because mm. at, at the end of two years or five years, those rates, most likely, uh, well, maybe not two years, but definitely five years, the rates would most likely be higher. And, you know, who's to say that you're able to afford it then? I, I think you're really 
rolling the dice there. Now, if, if, if there's some other reason that may be prudent, let's just say, uh, I don't know what that would be off the top of my head, but let's just say we could think of one for taking out an arm. Then what you'd want to make sure is you'd want to read the fine print to see what the, what's the maximum interest rate they could adjust to. So as an example, I had a line of credit on a lot of the equity I had in, in my rental properties in the United States. And one of the things I did on that, because that adjusts like every month, I think it did. And so I asked my my banker, who I'm good buddies with, I said, what's the max here? Is that in the fine print? <laughs> he said, yeah, the max is like, I think it was 8% or something like that. So even if interest rates, let's say the 10 year just balloons up to 20%, they're still able, only able to adjust it to a max of 8% throughout the life of the entire loan. So I, I would look for that type of language in the uh, specific loan documents. Now, I, I don't know if that's applicable to a, uh, to a, a mortgage and arm. I've never looked into it, but my guess is it, it probably is. There's probably some language in there uh, that you'd want to be cognizant of. Okay. So long-term fixed rate debt, especially with inflation going crazy, could be a great, uh, great thing. Cause again, inflation is making it easier for you to pay that debt over time. Yes, absolutely. Another thing everyone can do that we've discussed here is uh, educate themselves. You know, again, it doesn't take five hours a day. Just take a couple hours on the weekends and start reading about this stuff. Start watching some, you know, podcasts uh, like yours and uh, maybe some audio books. And uh, I, I think you know, one of the greatest things I ever learned as an entrepreneur, it's helped me throughout my whole life, is uh, I had a mentor say to me one time, he says, George, you got to know what you don't know. And it mm. seems so overly simplistic. But if you actually think about it, it's very profound. And very few people know what they don't know. And that creates an immense amount of risk, unnecessary risk. So if, if you can just start writing down what you don't know and then start educating yourself on that basis, you're, you're going to be way ahead of everyone else. And that's going to give you a significant edge. Another thing people can do, start building a network. You got to, there is no excuse not to build a network of like-minded individuals. Now that we have the internet, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got all these things. I mean, I, I don't know how long ago you started your podcast, but I, I, I would assume that in doing so, you have really built your own ne- network to where it's substantial and it's significantly larger than it was uh, and maybe more robust than it was before you started the podcast. And, uh, you know, people don't have to create content to do this because one of the main reasons the network is so important is because if we do go through some tumultuous times, you know, they've got your back, you've got their back, and these are people that are like-minded. You can help each other get through whatever it is that we're going to deal with from a standpoint of the economy or society at large. And this goes into the last thing that would be maybe more so just locally is just have a great community, you know, talking to your neighbors. I, I mean, I just got done interviewing and talking to a good friend of mine named Lynette Zhang and uh, she's local in Phoenix here. She has her own uh, urban farm where she feed just from her property. She feeds about 200 people. Wow. And she, yeah, she gives away most of the the food that she grows uh, to local shelters and whatnot. But it's a great example of someone that I have just in my local community here and in my network that has very similar views that, that, that understands global macro and is someone that I'm always there to help her and she's always there to help me. And I, you know, what's your downside there? Right. Absolutely nothing. And then from a standpoint of uh, finances, you know, I've got rebel capitalist live, which is a live event, a live conference I do which is my way to really kind of monetize my podcast. And that all comes as a result of my network because I started interviewing people on the podcast and, uh, you know, just reaching out and doing anything that I could to help out those people. So whether it was Lynn Alden, Brent Johnson, Jeff Snyder, Luke Groman, uh, Joseph Wang, I just spoke to him today, who used to run the trading desk at the New York Fed. These are all people that, you know, you help them out when they need help and you just become friends. So when I start my first live event, I just call all of them up, say, Hey, you want to speak? They're like, yeah, no problem. And then these are people that everyone would want to, uh, listen to and, and meet live. 
And now all of a sudden you've got a little side hustle. You've got a, a revenue stream coming in. That's a result of you just building that network. And uh, again, what's your downside there? And there is so much upside if we go into some tumultuous times. And uh, so I think that's the best advice I can give people. No, that's great, George. I appreciate it. So we're out of time. So where can people go to again, engage with you more? So you said you have your conference, Rebel Capitalist Live, but you know what's the name of your YouTube channels that they can go to and how can they engage more with you? Yeah, so thank you very much. The YouTube channel, the main one is George Gammon, just my name, uh, typical spelling, last name, G-A-M-M-O-N. And that's where I do whiteboard videos and a lot of uh, interviews with the people we were, uh, some of the people we were discussing there, uh, a lot of different people, not just from macro, but the entrepreneurial space, uh, finance. And um, then the other channel I have is Rebel Capitalist. That's kind of like daily live streams where I talk about the news. The podcast is Rebel Capitalist. But you can just Google my name and it'll all come up. Yeah, I thought it would be funny uh, for previous issues of your stuff. You can call it backgammon. Just a bad joke. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yes, yeah, good, good, good. Well, George, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I, I really appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Before you stop listening, ask yourself, what are one or two useful things you heard on this podcast that can help you overcome food and fertilizer shortages? skyrocketing prices, the cost of living, or your job being outsourced overseas or eliminated due to automation. Please like and subscribe and tell your friends and family about their Surviving Hard Times podcast. We're all going to need help now and in the near future.